Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Tokushikai Inside Look podcast. This episode is brought to you by our amazing patrons over at Patreon, who have generously donated as little as a cup of coffee to as much as the cost of a bowl of ramen per month. You can find episode videos for these interviews as well as deeper dives into other subject matters at patreon.com forward slash Tokushikai Canada. If you are enjoying this work, please consider supporting us. So my name is Andrea Kralik. I'm from Hungary originally. Now I also work here uh, in Hungary. I uh, began to practice Kyudo, which is basically my my main Budo art, 14 years ago, which is relatively a long time. Before I did Budo, I practiced athletics, high jump and triple jump for quite a long time. So I do basically sports already since uh, since I was six years old. So it's quite a long time. And I also went to the physical education and sports sciences university. So basically I have a, a really wide field of knowledge about physical activities and sports. But still, after I did the athletics, I had the feeling that I need something uh, where I can, where I can do sports or physical activity all the time so it's not like athletics where you have a high performance mindset in in all the sports and after you are finished with that uh, high performance activity or you are out of that age period then you can't really participate in these kind of sports so there's a reason why i began to search for something else and since I had a really serious interest in, in Japanese culture through mangas and animes, I just uh, thought about what, why not trying martial arts. And I had the chance to go and visit a karate training and uh, I just stayed there. And from then on, I was introduced to a lot of other type of martial arts like EI Jutsu, which is uh, almost like EI Do, but, but a little bit older version. We work with real swords and it's a little bit uh, different from EI Do, but resembles a lot. And from then I went to Kyudo, which basically stayed with me all the time. So now I'm just practicing Kyudo and I, I think Kyudo will also stay with me for, for a long time, also from now on. So you were saying that you started exploring these other arts because you, you found that these high performance sports, it, you, don't, you can't continue it for a long period of time, but you're still relatively young. So what was that? Like, was it, did you already find yourself like going down in physical ability? That's why you went there? Or did you just look in the future and say, I need to define something? And how old were you when you started? Yes, halfway yes and halfway not. It's like, I don't know if you ever did athletics or or these kind of high performance uh, sports. It's like if you have a trainer who is who is really interested in in high performance and you want and he wants to bring you to to a lot of competitions then that makes it already some kind of pressure and in my case it was like I did the athletics also in the university and I wasn't really that uh, that good sportman so i was able to go to the national competitions but not into an international level so that's not really the kind of sportsman where a lot of trainer wants to invest energy and and interest and and time into if i would had a lot of good results probably all the teachers or the trainers would have said that okay then let's work a little bit longer and let's see what comes out of this but because i didn't have a good uh, results then also the trainer side and also my side was like okay this doesn't really have such a, a bright future so yeah and that's the time I was a uh, fourth year in the university where I just realized that this doesn't really have the 
the the long term future what i would like to have okay so you started budo like as you were exiting university what was your life like those first couple of years whether in the practice and also outside like how are you managing your schedule what were you pursuing outside of school for me it was a little bit complicated because i was so after university i began to so I, ha I had five years of university. So in the last year of university, I already did uh, martial arts. I already did karate. And from already in that time, I, I had some problems because all the trainings were in the evening and I lived in a different town than my university and my training. So I had to commute every day to school and to training and to my home so sometimes it was a little bit challenging but uh, still I was able to manage but then I began to work as a teacher in a completely different town so I was commuting quite a distance from uh, my home to my workplace and from my workplace to my training and I always arrived at around 11 o'clock in the evening at home so it was a little bit difficult but yeah in the training i was i was like really feeling at home it was a lot of fun because i really like to to work intensely physically and uh, karate gave me all these all these possibilities to to really work and really use my whole body in in every aspect so i was feeling really good in the trainings but because karate is is a little bit more manly uh, sports than than all the others or a lot of other sports I had all the time just men as my teammates so sometimes it was a little bit difficult <laughs> yeah I can imagine even with you said long jump and triple jump those are like you're sprinting super fast and then you're exploding so I I, I, I can picture that I did that in elementary school and then then I look at Kudo and it was like Kudo is nothing like that so how <laughs> help me make this connection here yeah, actually it was really funny because at first I did karate and kudo parallel. So while I was here in Hungary, I did both at uh, not not at, on the same days, but in a week I had also karate training and kudo training and it gave me a really good balance. Like uh, one of the trainings was uh, really challenging physically and the other was more challenging like like mentally of course kudo has also its really challenging parts physically it doesn't look really difficult or or complicated but the more you practice the more you discover in it also mentally and also technically so kudo is is exactly the the point for for the saying that don't uh, judge the book according its cover so <laughs> kudo is definitely not one of those sports yes of course the the lower part of the body is not that actively used as as in other sports but still kudo if you practice it correctly and if you do it correctly it also uses the lower part of the body and the upper part is of course as as it's visible use is used actively okay yeah definitely and i can see that so now you have kudo you're doing karate and you did the kind of yeah uh, yeah yeah um one thing i wanted to ask you is that now you have experience with instructors so sensei in these three different arts but also you had like someone pushing you before in your athletics with a trainer. Can you maybe talk about the differences and how the senseis teach and also the differences between a sensei and a trainer? Yes, it's really funny because a lot of people think that, yes, of course, there are cultural differences between Japan and between Europe, which gives also a little bit of difference between education. But basically I have the feeling and the more people I meet from Japan and, and from, from Europe, the more I have the feeling that 
in these kind of aspects which which requires a person to to give themselves because teacher give basically themselves in front of the students is much more about characteristic personal characteristics than more about culture and about martial arts so i met also in japan while i was myself teaching kudo and also studying kudo that teachers are much more about about their teaching style for themselves of course in kudo they have a really strict parts about where you have to begin the teaching so how you have to lead in the students into the kudo and in which steps you have to teach the students but they really have a really uh, strong personalities like uh, some of them are really strict about the rules and uh, and everything is about the appearance and about the the system and uh, some of them are basically you have to learn the technique because technique is everything and if you do the correct technique then you have the time and you have the chance to learn the system and and the whole procedure which uh, also belongs to to kudo so also in kudo they have a lot of aspects and a lot of methods how they do the teaching and uh, i can say the same thing about about the european style coaching about uh, athletics where they are really strict about about the the surrounding how you have to pay attention to to the to the rules which are also there in athletics and uh, how it is really important to to learn the correct technique and how you have to learn everything at first from the very basics and then you can just border your view about the whole athletic and about all the other sports so it has um, quite in my opinion it has a quite wide range of teaching methods what i can say about european or western teaching style and eastern teaching style the one and the most most appealing difference between them is that the european con- concentrating more about explaining and the asian style is more about showing so it's more about learning while copying the teacher and the western style is more about explaining everything in details giving a really detailed explanation and then they are then showing something and then they are le- leading the students into the into the sports itself so this is probably the most most interesting and the biggest difference between the the two teaching styles about the teachers like how it is different between sensei and and trainer because japan and all the asian uh, cultures have a more serious ranking system should i say yeah it is really important how respect to to respect your teacher and to always have the correct way of calling out correct way of naming so in the eastern style you always have to pay uh, close attention to to how you speak with your with your sensei in europe it has already a little bit more more free style which allows uh, you to call the teacher by its name you don't have to call it trainer uh, so it has a more easier way to to communicate with with your trainer with your teacher just a, a quick uh, example to show us cuz those of us that do budo we know what technique means like if you're doing kudo you have the hasatsu if you're doing iaido you have kata when when you're saying technique in athletic athletics those basic fundamentals what do you actually mean by what is being taught 
The basic fundamentals are, it has a really, really basic fundamentals because athletics is a little bit different from, from the Asian martial arts. Because uh, even though we call the martial arts in a, in a complete package, like as martial arts, it has completely different techniques and completely different movements in itself. But athletics has its, its really fundamental and uh, basic elements like for running and for jumping and even for throwing, it has the, the run up, which has basically the, the same system. Like you place your legs in the same way. You have to work with your feet in the same way. Maybe the steps are a little bit different or you work a little bit differently with your knees and your, and your joints, but basically the, the the work of the legs resembles a lot. So basically the real fundamental element of, of the athletics is basically the steps, how you use your legs, how you actively work with your legs to, to get to the, to the ground and how actively you try to uh, bring your body forward, how you actively, you try to, to, go into the, into the air by jumping or how actively you try to get forward, like in, in, in running and also like in throwing, like jewelry, where you have to make the run up to be able to throw. So it has really basic elements in itself. Have you found that you were able to apply any of what you've learned in there to your martial arts? It's really difficult to say because I, in, in, in my opinion, I always believe that everything what you learn is, is useful somewhere. So basically what I learned from athletics is like move the movement itself or how I can coordinate my body quite freely because in athletics, I learned a lot of movements, like not just uh, jumping, also running and also throwing. I was able to learn a lot of movements. So I was able to learn how to coordinate my, my legs, my arms, my whole body, which was really useful in, in martial arts because there you always have to see and, and then copy. So you don't really have to have the time to watch yourself, what ex actually you are doing it. I think the correct pronunciation is kinesthetic in, in, in English is basically the, um, the feeling for your own body to, to feel where your legs, where your arms are going, what position your body is and athletics give you a really good feel to this. So you learn to understand even without watching where your hands or where your legs or where your whole body is. So I do believe that athletic was a really uh, useful and a really practical sport for me to, to prepare for martial arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're saying it on, on multiple levels. There's the basic fundamentals of applying your muscles, but then there's also this awareness of how your body moves so that when you're being taught something new, you might not be able to consciously think of what you're doing, but your body will be able to copy it when you see it? Yes, exactly. It, it gives you a really uh, good base for, for learning new movements, for learning new sports, because even without thinking seriously about it, or even without looking at your, at your body, you will know what your body is actually doing and not, not really automatically, but eventually the automatization will come much faster than uh, normal for normal people. You mentioned that now, now you have experience in, in that like athletics in Europe. And then you mentioned that you were, you went to Japan and you did some training there and you actually taught Kudo there. Can you start from the very beginning of when this became even a possibility in your head that you can move to Japan? And then what happened along that journey? 
Yes, basically in my head that I want to go to Japan began already in in late uh, in the second part of elementary school. Then I began to watch animes and and mangas and all the basic or or these really general way of uh, knowing Japan. And then I just uh, wanted to see it really with my own eyes. I'm the type of person who, of course, I believe people who, what they are saying and what they are explaining about something, but I really love to see it with my own eyes and really like to experience everything by myself. So then I began to want to go to Japan. And because I did still athletics, I didn't really want it to change to martial arts. But in the meantime, I already had the the idea to, at the end of the university, I had the idea to change from athletics. So I began to do karate and uh, then I began to search for scholarship. Sorry, I forgot the word scholarship. Uh, So I began to search for scholarships, which in the Japanese, from the Japanese government, there are relatively a lot of scholarships in here in Hungary. One is the researcher and one is the teacher scholarship. And at first I uh, tried with researcher scholarship. I tried it for seven years and didn't manage to get it. And in the meantime, I began to teach at a high school, physical education. So I was told that why don't I should try the teacher scholarship because there I have a little bit more chance to get it. And the teacher scholarship, I was able to get it for the first try. And uh, this scholarship is a one and a half year long scholarship at a national university and I was able to go to a national university where my Kudo teacher who came not every year, but quite often to Europe, to Hungary, to uh, make seminars. And he was like, okay, why don't, aren't you coming to us? And then we can just help you also do Kudo. And I was able to get the scholarship over there. And at the end of the scholarship, I was invited by the university if I would like to be a teacher there because they have a a free job there and they think that I would be good for this job. Of course, I had a lot of things here at home because I didn't say to my workplace that I'm going to Japan forever. So... I had to come back home and uh, speak with uh, my family and uh, with my workplace, but I was able to manage everything. So I took the work offer, the job offer, and I worked in Japan for Japan for five years at the university. I was a Kudo teacher over there. And uh, I was able also to teach Japanese students. So I had a regular class for Japanese students, university students, and also classes for for foreigners. Could you describe the university and the classes you were teaching? Like the the scholarship that you got, you went there to teach something, and then that changed into Kudo. Could you talk about what was that university looking for in terms of what you were doing initially? And then why did they need to ask you to be a Kudo teacher? Yes, actually, it's like this scholarship is not really like like teaching. It's more like about research, it's about education. So it's a one and a half year scholarship, but uh, you are not really teaching there, but more researching about education and the teaching methods. And then you have to hand in a report, which is more like a, a diploma and more like a thesis about the research, what you did. And uh, then with that is the scholarship finished. And meanwhile, while I was doing the scholarship, I was actively going to the Kudo trainings. And it came so that the Kudo teacher who was there said that he would like to have me 
as a as a kudo teacher so basically from a physical education teacher i began i became a, a kudo teacher but the interesting part is that i didn't have any teaching teacher experience in kudo in europe because probably uh, a lot of people know but the kudo itself or the martial arts itself is not uh, a compulsory here in, in in europe so you don't have to teach it a lot of european not yet of martial arts are not even known here in in europe can you so most people that are listening probably have been to japan on either vacation or for training and usually it's to one of the big cities but you weren't in one of the big cities could you talk about the university the city and also what was the martial arts community like in that area Yes, uh, the university and also the name of the, the city is Tsukuba. It's basically one of the biggest uh, university, national university in whole Japan. Uh, it's a really important and famous university in Japan, one of the strongest uh, university, national university in, in whole Japan. Uh, it's quite near to Tokyo. 50 minutes by by uh, train so it's quite easy to access the university it university itself doesn't really have like hundreds of years of history because it was founded uh, in 1925 but no 1975 sorry 1975 but the martial arts section itself is quite famous and important the Kyudo, the Kendo, the Judo, these three martial arts are uh, really famous and uh, important. The Judo itself is one of the center of Japanese Judo because they also produce Olympic participants in this Tsukuba University. So uh, yes, it's a really famous and strong university in whole Japan. The community itself was really interesting because even though it's a national university, a lot of foreigners come to this university, also researchers and also martial arts, because this university is basically the, the door to the, to the European Kudo community. From this university was the first teacher to go to Germany and make a seminar there about Kudo. And then from, from, from that time, basically Kudo began to, to develop in, in Central and, and East Europe, like in Germany, in Austria, in Hungary, in Poland, in uh, Slovakia. So more and more this style, which is uh, called uh, Heki. The, the, the style of the, of the Kudo is called Heki and this school got more and more attraction in Central and in East uh, Europe. And because this style is quite famous or I should say quite uh, popular in this, this area, all the European students are going to this uh, school to this university because there are teachers who are teaching just this style. So even though it's a completely Japanese uh, community in a normal way, because they have, of course, a Kudo club there with uh, university students, Japanese university students, in the whole year, there are always foreigners also visiting this dojo and practicing sometimes together with the students, sometimes by themselves uh, using the dojo and uh, practicing their foreigners. So it's a really international university. So w when you were, when you decided, okay, they, you had to go back to Hungary, but then they offered you this, this job, what was going through your head in terms of was it something that you were looking forward to? Was it something that like you were thinking, okay, at the end of this five year, uh, year and a half, I want to see if I can stay here? Or was it more of a surprise and then you're like, okay, I have to think it through? Actually, it's really funny because it was like, I, I never in my life imagined something like this. And uh, it's really interesting because in the scholarship, 
it was written that I can't take on job offers. So if I, if I take on job offers, I have to pay back all the scholarship what I got from the government. So it was a quite risky idea from the university <laughs> to, to offer me a job. And I was, it was actually my dream to stay in Japan because I really enjoyed the first one and a half year, but I was also quite hesitating because that was a lot of money. And if I had to pay it back, I was, so it was, I was hesitating in the time, but uh, then all of my teachers at the university told me that you don't have to worry about it. It won't, they won't make you pay. And actually it was true. So I, I didn't have to pay back all, all my scholarships, but I was really happy when they offered me this job because you know, it be, my, my passion became my job. So of course I really enjoyed it and I really loved all this thing. I really love to teach. I really enjoyed uh, to be a teacher and, uh, and of course I could teach what I like the most, the kudo. So it was a, a dreamlike job for me for, with these five years. At the end of the, of the contract, I tried to uh, find jobs in Japan, but probably a lot of people don't really know about the Japanese uh, working culture. But in Japan, uh, being a tar tourist is a lot of fun. It's really beautiful. They are really nice and they are really like welcoming. And then when you began to work there, it's a little bit difficult, especially for foreigners. Also the working hours are really long, especially by companies. So eight hours is, is out of this, out of question. You have to work 10 or 12 hours. If you, if you want to make a big, a good picture about yourself. So you have to work a lot. And you always have to begin at the bottom. So if you go to some kind of a company, then you always have to begin with copying papers and, and this is not really for me. So I tried to find the job at a university as a university teacher. And because I couldn't find any jobs, I had to come back home to Hungary. But still, while I was in, in Japan, it was a lot of fun. It had a lot of difficulties and challenging parts while, uh, even though I really tried everything to, to be a part of the community, to be a part of the, of the, of the team, of the club. Still, I was always a foreigner. So it's a little bit uh, frustrating that even though I was the one who stayed at the dojo the longest time, I was always the one who worked really hard and, and I went to every possible event, kudo, and uh, still at the end of the day, I was someone who is, who is in the club, but still just just something which is, which is on the sidelines. So Japan has a relatively closed society. So as a foreigner, it's a little bit challenging to live there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard stories from other people too, that move there and are practicing. And for some reason, they just wouldn't allow you into their group. So I could definitely empathize with that in terms of your Let's say, let's take, go towards your practice in terms of your, your Kudo, when you moved to Japan, how did you see, what, what did you see as the biggest changes in how you practice? How, what kind of improvements have you made and what have you brought back to, to help, I guess, bring more of that mindset or those approaches to European Kudo? The biggest difference was I had two things, what I, I found uh, really interesting and it was like the biggest difference for me. The one is the possibility to practice. So because in Japan, there are a lot of, uh, dojos which are available 
for for quite a long time so you can just go there and bring your bow and arrows and you can shoot even if you have to pay for it because there are like uh, sports centers which build a kudo dojo inside and you just for two hours you have to pay 500 yen and yeah you just buy yourself a ticket and go up to the dojo shoot and then you just come out so this this possibility to train a lot if you really want to train is one of the biggest differences and especially in university and also in high school they have trainings every day so you just go to the school and go to the training and you just go back home and this everyday routine gives you a, a really nice rhythm in your in your trainings and in your in your whole martial arts the other is the is the material what you can what you can get at so it's like also in 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 paper form and also in in verbal form because you have the chance to go up to your uh, japanese trainer and you just can ask something and he will explain it to you right on the spot but if you live in ja in europe all the japanese trainers are almost all the time in japan and even if that question comes to your mind at the second, in Europe, you don't have the chance to ask. So all the information, all the knowledge, what you can, what you have access to is, uh, is completely different. So you, if you are really interested and if you really want to know a lot of things, then, then you can learn a lot in a really short time period in, in Japan. And this is basically what I was able to bring with myself, this, this, uh, this knowledge, what I was able to collect in, in Japan and also the physical knowledge, because if you train every day, basically a lot of, a lot of movement sinks into your body and you don't really have to think about it. Your body just does its work. And, and even if you don't train that much after you came back to, after I came back to, to Europe, I still have that feeling in my body and I still exactly know what my body is doing good and what not. <laughs> so, so these kind of automatizations still stay in my body. So it helps me a lot to, to stay on the same level because the less you train, the worse you became, began to be able to do your martial arts. So it is quite challenging to come back to Europe after Japan. And I really miss the, those trainings, but still I really try to do everything not to lose the shape I was able to, to develop in Japan. Yeah, that's that's so interesting point because it it reminds me of how it, when when you stop practice when you you when you don't get as much as you previously you don't just stay at your current level you're always you're always going down so if you're not if you're not improving you're basically wearing away there is no baseline that you can stick to so yeah that is hard so one thing I want to ask now that you you started your practice in Hungary and then you moved to Japan for a few years now you're back. Throughout this whole ordeal, like because you're moving around, you're kind of alone in this period. Who are the type of people? Who are the people that really help you, like that gave you the support and make you feel like, okay, I can continue pursuing what I want to do and giving you strength and support behind the scenes? Can you talk about a few people? Uh, yes, basically in Hungary, all the time, my parents were those who were all the time behind me and. Uh, even though they were really, they were really against me going to Japan. So also my mom and my dad was like, okay, okay, you, you will go. I know you will go, but please don't go. So it was <laughs> a little bit tough, uh, challenging to, to go to Japan. And because it's, it's really far away, I wasn't able to come back uh, often to, to them. So yeah but still they were all the time 
saying to me, okay, this is your life. This is what you have to live. So you have to live it so how you want it. So this support uh, stayed with me all the time. Even now they are, they are telling me that even if you want to go to some other countries, maybe because now I began to do for a half a year, I began to do Kung Fu. So even if you want to go to China to learn Kung Fu, then you just go to China and learn Kung Fu. So they are really, really nice people and I really love them. And the other people whose support and positive ideas were all the time with me were my karate teacher from here, Hungary, and the Kudo teacher from Japan, because he was all the time really welcoming. And he was basically the one who invited me to the, to the job at the university. So he was the person who was like, okay, Andy, you can, you are a teacher, you can teach really well. So why don't you try it? Why don't you try to stay here at our university and, and try to do this job and, and, and enjoy yourself. And these, these four people, the Japanese teacher is called Mori Sensei and the Hungarian karate teacher is uh, called Shandor. And these four people were all the time, like not, not really supporting me. Like, ah, oh, you can do it. Ah, oh, you can, you can make it. You, you will be able to do it. But still I was able, I, I knew it that if I have any questions to them, or if I go to them to ask for help, they will always there and they will be ready to help me. So these, these people were basically my my lightning house. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of going all over the place here, but so w when you became a teacher in Kyudo, when you, Mori Sensei said, okay, why don't you try this? Did you have to shift your mindset around what teaching Budo is? Because in most places it's a volunteer kind of thing. So teachers are just practitioners that gone to a certain point and they're like, all we need to do is play, pay for the space, but I'm not a professional. I have other work. Did you have to change how you thought about teaching Kudo when now you're getting paid for it? Basically, yes, because basic for me, it was relatively easy, easy because I was already teacher for five years in Hungary and I was teaching in a high school physical education. So more or less, I already knew how I have to build up a class, how, where I have to start, how the flow should be and where I have to end the classes, but still teaching at the university and teaching to Japanese students who quite often doesn't really come to university because they want to learn because uh, Japanese university except from law and uh, medical uh, universities, they don't really have that serious um, stance towards uh, university. A lot of students go there just because they need a high education paper, like graduating pe uh, paper. And even though they graduated from physical education and sports sciences major, they go to sell something to a completely different company. So they don't really use what they learned at the university. 60 or 70% of the students from university don't really choose work in their own major. So because of that, the teaching at the university was for me at least a little bit challenging because I know how serious I had to take my own universities here in Hungary. So it was really like a shock to me that sports students who learn sports and who want to be sports teacher, maybe in the future, don't really take it seriously and they are laughing through the class and, and so it was a little bit challenging, 
And also because I didn't really had a real knowledge about the steps, how I have to teach Kudo from the very basics. So basically to my classes came students who are doing judo, who are doing rugby and, and athletics and soccer, but don't know anything about Budo, about martial arts. So I really had to begin from, from the very, very beginnings which was already challenging because I didn't have the knowledge. So at the, f at, the at the beginning, I had to teach together with my, with my Japanese teacher and he was also coming to my classes. So I was like, like a teacher trainee who was practicing teaching. And then after a few months, I was able already able to teach alone so he allowed me to teach completely alone because he said that okay now you know the method now you know how you have to build up your classes you are already a teacher originally so you can to do it by yourself and I was able to teach by myself so yeah that it has some similarities but there were also a lot of differences and Normally in universities, there's, if there's an official class somewhere, like if you're part of the school, then you get assessed or evaluated in some way. Was there any of that in the Kudo class too? Like, do they get papers or something that says, oh, I passed this and I got whatever? How, how does that work? In, in this aspect, the Japanese university and the Hungarian university resembles a lot. So it's like you get evalu evaluated, sorry. <laughs> evaluated by by your teacher and it has a practical exam so i uh, didn't make them write some kind of report or or anything else we had just a practical exam at the end of the class and then they got their credits for it and they could get forward so they didn't have to repeat the class in Japan, it's quite interesting because they can choose between martial arts. So they have like a lot of uh, sports, what they have to do. But uh, for example, they had to have to choose two ball game sports, just two martial arts. So they don't have to take every, every possible sports. They can choose just among them. And in a uh, case of martial arts, they can choose from Kendo, Judo, and Kudo. From these three, they have to choose two. And uh, Kudo was quite popu popular all the time, even before me and probably even after me, <laughs> because it seems quite easy. You don't have to move, the, move that much around and you don't have to do a lot of things during the classes, but it's quite uh, tricky because you have to move a lot and it's completely different from all the other all the other kudo classes or, or rather sports classes what was for me quite surprising and I was like really surprised that even though I became a teacher and they knew that I will be the only teacher at the classes the students still choose my classes so a lot of students came to my classes. I always had difficulties to manage the, the number of students because of course, Kudo dojos also have uh, their uh, boundaries and around the, in my dojo where I was teaching around 40 people can practice normally. But there were always 50 like students who wanted to participate. So I always had to cut it and say that, okay, guys, you can't come. Okay, you have to choose a different sports. Please go to another sport. sport. So it was quite surprising how, how popular it was, even though I was a foreigner uh, and I told them something what, what their own culture is. Wait, so 40 something people, a, a normal Kudojo has like five mato and barely enough space for one group of Thai Hai. How, how did you manage all that people? Because this is one of the biggest uh, national, univer national uh, university. It has a really big dojo. It has 11 matos. 
and also it has a smaller dojo which is called the uh, sub dojo so it's basically a kudo complex so with 11 matos it's already 40 people is not that impossible still challenging so i was i was always facing some difficulties but but it was still a lot of fun and uh, because this was only just a half a year class so it wasn't really a long uh, term study we didn't really go tai hai so these these ceremonial shooting we just concentrated only on shooting itself because that's basically the fun part of kudo students came there to experience the shooting experience how you with the traditional japanese bow yumi you you shoot and you hit the target the mato so just doing students tai hai all the time it would be quite quite boring and you were doing Heki Ryu style there too, shaman style? Yes, but we also had to teach about, about showman. So the differences between the showman, how the tai hai between the two is, is different. And uh, if you, by some chance, I mean the students, if the students by some chance began to teach at a high school where there is a kudo club and they have to be uh, the advisor for it, then how what they have to pay attention to and how they have to be careful about the two styles, two main styles. So I, I want to move on to just the, the wrapping up of the interview with some rapid fire questions, some short questions, but there's so much other stuff that I do want to ask you because they're just, it's very fascinating all the experiences you've had. So it'd be great if I could have a follow-up conversation sometime in the future, but let's just ask you a few questions to get to know you a little bit better. Do you have a quote or a proverb or a motto, something that you like to repeat in your mind or that you live by or practice by? That's a good question i i probably not the type of person who is i'm really about 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 body feeling how i can how how i sense my own body and how the shoot itself feels so of course i have the points where i have to pay attention to okay now i have to twist with the with the left hand or i have to make a quick release with my right hand but for me, it's everything about the, the feeling, how, what I feel from the shoot itself. So uh, if I have to say something, then it's uh, probably the left hand. So how I have to twist with my left hand, because that's basically the heart of the Kudo. Mm -hmm. uh, so speaking of Kudo technique, what stage of the Hasetsu, the eight stages of shooting, is your favorite and why? Can I say all of it? Because every every stage has its has its pinpoints where you if you pay attention, then everything goes well. But if you lose some kind of points at every stage, then all the whole shooting is already out of the question and, and is already trash. I should say, basically, it's not good to say it, but if you make a mistake at the beginning, then you won't be able to correct it at the second half. So I do believe that every stage is as important as the others, because a good preparation makes a good base to a really nice house, which you are building up because every shoot is like some kind of castle, what you build up from the basement till the sailing. Oh, what a wonderful analogy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this one you can't cop out and say everything. What is your comfort food? So when you're feeling down and you want to pick me up and you eat it and it makes you smile, what food is your comfort food? <laughs> Difficult question. Probably pasta. <laughs> probably, probably pasta is the, the, the food which makes me because it has a lot of, for me, comforting myself is like having an easy way. So pasta is like, like I put it into the water, heat it up and it's already finished. So it's really easy to make, easy to use and really lots of variations. So there is 
Pasta is like the infinitive variation of food. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So last question before we wrap up, if we were to log into your YouTube account, what videos would YouTube naturally show you, recommend you based on what you've watched in the past? I would like to make a YouTube channel, which is basically also my, my, my future plans, but about what I would like to show in my, in my channel is how you, how you, how deep Kudo can be because the depths, depths of Kudo is only just uh, visible when you practice it. The more you practice it, the deeper it gets, but even though it gets deeper and deeper, you still have to have a really uh, good overview about yourself, about your own techniques and about your own self. So I would like to show in, in my channel, I would like to show in my channel that even though you are doing Kudo and you began to, to be a part of something really big and something really deep, you still have to stay yourself because you are the one who is doing the Kudo and uh, you are the one who is shooting the bow. So if I would be able to do a channel and if I will be able to do my channel, then I would like to show people that, that you can become something, part of something, even though you stay yourself and even though you, you, you are able to protect your own uh, style or own personality. Mm. That's a great way to, to wrap up this first of, I hope, uh, a couple of interviews. And um, before we go, is there anything else that you might want to say to the audience, the people that either practice Kudo or practice other martial arts or just in general, something to close this off? Yes, I would like to ask all of them, don't rush. Because every, every martial arts has its own personality, has its own pace of going forward. And especially because Eastern and Western has a little bit different rhythm. We, we in the Western style side tend to, to rush, tend to want to know everything from the very beginning. You have to be patient. You have to wait for the for the martial arts itself to show itself. So be a little bit more patient because we are, we are rushing. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. This, this was great. Thank you okay. very much. Bye. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode because we have a lot more exciting conversations to share as we explore the world of the traditional Japanese martial arts. The Inside Look podcast is made possible by our patrons over at Patreon, so if you enjoy this work and want them to continue, please consider supporting us for as little as a cup of coffee. There are many more ways for us to work together by connecting with us on Facebook and Instagram at tokushikai.canada and subscribing to our monthly newsletter at subscribe.tokushikai.ca. Until next time, thanks for listening.